we're going to move on to our next panel, um, which is looks at Leonor Carrington, a recent British and Spanish scholarly work. And um, so we'd like to welcome we have Julia, Alba, and Alicia. Alicia, is that right? Alicia, Alicia. <laughs> from uh, La Autónoma de Madrid uh, University. She holds a PhD um, from HUB, and her current research interests include women's literature and gender psychoanalysis, feminisms, sexualities, modernism, postmodernism, everything. We're yes. <laughs> uh, very appreciative that she's come all this way to share her research. Well, the, the first thing I want to do is I, I want to thank the, the organizers for this wonderful conference and, and for having me here. And the second thing I, I, I want to do is I want to, well, I maybe I'll start a bit by, by saying I've been, I've been a bit cheeky. I've been working on Leonora Carrington for quite a while now, and I decided to come without PowerPoint or notes or anything. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a brief overview of the kind of approaches I've been taking on Carrington's work, particularly the, the, the writing, which is the one I've been researching on. I, I discovered Carrington in uh, 1992. I, was, I had give, been given a, a grant to study a PhD for a PhD in the University of Hull, and I didn't know what to do. And my mom uh, presented me with uh, the book Wayward Girls and Wicked Women, that has already been mentioned here today. And when I read The Debutant, I, I went immediately to the biographies in the back of the book and I read that Leonora Carrington, she had been uh, in France and that she had had a, a time in Spain in a mental asylum and that she was living in Mexico and when I read that I thought I've got the, my thesis, the, the topic for my thesis. So I started working on her in 1992 and that marks now 25 years ago and in 25 years uh, in these last 25 years, a lot of things have happened with uh, Leonora Carrington, particularly the first, uh, for me, the very, very impressive one is that when I first started uh, writing and researching on her, every time I mentioned, uh, people said, what are you doing? And I'm writing a thesis on a, on a British author. And, and they said, and I said, Leonora Carrington, and everybody said, oh, the painter. And I said, yes. And then they said, the one in the Bloomsbury group. And I said, no, not that Carrington. <laughs> The other Carrington. It, it was so much so that my friends uh, bought me a t-shirt that said, not that Carrington, the other Carrington. <laughs> Yesterday in the spa at the airport in, in Liverpool airport, I, I, I had the, my notes and I, it could be read at some point in my notes, could be read Leonora Carrington. The shop assistant said, oh, are you working on Leonora Carrington? I love her work. And I went to the exhibition and I was fascinated. And I, I thought, how amazing, in 25 years, the, the one that was better known was Dora Carrington and the one that is well known now is, is Leonora. Anyway, uh, so I wrote my thesis about her and I divided, uh, I, the, the way I approached her, her work, I saw three moments in her writing. And the first moment is the one I called um, dreams and the nightmare. And I mentioned the nightmare because uh, the, the way it is the, uh, the, the time I explored the stories of the, um, she wrote in France, in French, and then she, she corrected and translated for the Virago edition. And uh, they always, in those stories, there's always a horse at the beginning of the story. A horse appears that takes the normally unnamed uh, narrator and protagonist to the dream, to the story, to the, to the magic that happens. And that's why I called it the nightmare, la yegua de la noche, is my dream. And in, in that uh, section, well, I analyze all, all those, uh, uh, that, that, those stories from Little Francis and the 1937 to 1940 stories. 
And my main claim there is that um, they are stories not clothes as dreams, and they are not uh, either dreams. Is um, they they have the structure of the dream. They they have beginnings, as I say, with uh, normally a horse that appears. Uh, in the middle, there is always this. Um, the middle of the stories is always engaging in the um, uh, a, a some kind of otherness or this otherness, and the female protagonists normally talk about entrapment and being made in turned into an object and how they, they reject that position. And, and the stories, um, and, and the ones are very often that objectify them, are these uh, males, husbands or, or fathers that um, entrap or prevent them from, from achieving their goals and, and moving on. Uh, these stories use the function, is, again, they're, they're, they're very, they disturb boundaries. They use the function of the, of the fantastic with the, the formality, with the structure of the, of the marvelous, and they are blending continuously uh, all these, uh, these characteristics. They are characterized by unconclus unconclusiveness, and they end like dreams, it's like they drop you like a dream do drops you, like when you, you finish. So they, they present exactly that, that structure, that you are taken somewhere, but it's not, they, they are not fairy tales in the proper sense with a proper ending. It's just when, when they, the end is when you feel like you are waking up. Um, very often as well, the stories have a hint, <coughs> if, if we could systematize those stories, but three, four, five of them, present a way where the story is handed on to us, like in, in Pigeon Fly, for example. We are, the, the, it seems like the story that is being narrated is being passed on to us, to the, to the reader, to, to analyze it. So there is the, the beginning, or, or rather the, 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 the explanation, that there is no pretense at uh, authority, authority in the sense of ownership, of being authoritative about the, the text, but rather that the text Belongs to it belongs to us now to do with it whatever we want, which resonates very much with things that have been talked about today already. That it is probably her lack of uh, her not wanting to analyze or to or to comment on on her work, the one that leaves so many possibilities open because it is us the the, the ones that are creating her writing. Then uh, for the the second moment in her in her writing. I analyzed um, the, the mainly down below and, and the stories around um, New York when she finally disengages from, from Ernst. And probably my, well, uh, they, they are all readings of, of, the, of the, the writing, very close readings, or real close readings of the writings. Probably the most two uh, peculiar findings in this uh, in, in, in this second part was the fact that, uh, well, I, I claimed at the time, and I, I, I still maintain, that um, she was not mad, that it was uh, an exercise. I mean, she, she did do things that resounded or looked like she was having mental problems. But she was, it, it was an attitude, it was a, a way of expressing herself, uh, that something that she had to pay for uh, really dearly, but she was not mad. And I interviewed in uh, 1996, I think it was, I interviewed Dr. Morales, the one that, uh, that uh, treated her, the son uh, of Don Luis, and, and he confirmed to me that he, she, she was not mad. He said uh, she was uh, handed to us, literally, he used that uh, word, nos la entregaron. And, and he was very kind of uh, conspiratorial about the way the, the Leonora had got to, to Santander and the, the treatment and everything. And he already pointed at um, Harold Carrington's, Leonora's father, as, as the one that was behind a kind of plot to ha have her locked in. So I did go into that for a, for a while, and, and I did research a, a bit into imperial chemicals. Uh, it got quite serious, to the, to, so much so to the point that my, my supervisor said, don't go any further into that because it's 
you are not an art historian, you are not a politician, you are writing a, a thesis on, on, on lit a literary and on a writer. And, and it got quite serious because no, nobody wanted to talk about imperial chemicals and imperial chemicals at the time was involved, was, was having talks with uh, Franco and Franco's regime. And there were, uh, Spain at the time wanted to, to join the, the Second World War, of course, on Hitler's side. And uh, some businesses, are, um, uh, nobody knew, I mean, he started, for example, Morales started saying nobody knew who would win the war. And that's, and that's how he started talking to me about imperial chemicals and the people that Gilliland he talked to in Madrid and many people that then were deleted from her first publications to the second. There were some things that were very odd that had been taken from the first writings into the second and that hinted that somehow there was quite uh, something more political than, than just the, the, the naughty girl being taken into being punished or being removed. Anyway, that, that was one of the things that my findings and, well, another, uh, some of the other readings I made was of the, the differences in the different translations in, in the Embas, in Bab publication. She says uh, that um, the, the requete, soldiers requete, are called requete because it means requete is a lot, an absolute lot. So they, they, they were the very extremist fascist uh, soldiers. Requete is the, the utmost fascist extreme soldiers. And, and she says in the Enva uh, that they raped her one after another and then that gets removed again for the publication and becomes they tried to rape me. So things like that differences is what I, I went into I, and I was researching and also about the way the, the text travel like in one of the presentations now, we talked about how the text has been uh, first was oral, then it became written, it was translated, it was passed on, and original versions being lost. So, um, as to the question that Alessia was asking before, as to when she says, uh, was this um, a, a hospital or a concentration camp? I have to say that in 1996, Dr. Morales was still using very ambiguous terminology with me. He was saying things like nobody knew who was going to win the world and uh, Spain uh, uh, unidad en el conocimiento and using very, uh, kind of very much a Francoist uh, Catholic terminology when talking to me. And, and, uh, and then he confirmed very uh, things to me like, for example, when they didn't want Leonora to understand, uh, he did talk to Frau Asegurado in German. So of course, if, if you are suffering from delusions, if you are being drugged, and, and you hear uh, around you, they are speaking in German, which was confirmed by him. That's why she, she would obviously question, was this a, a concentration camp or a hospital? And also it was very, very interesting because at the time, uh, Dr. Morales had suffered um, a brain uh, an ictus, um, and he, he was recovering from it. And so I went with my list of questions and I was like, is it true, like not wanting to believe it, is it true that she actually wrote the, the road in the, uh, on the, uh, the the horse of the people of the cemetery? And, and he said, like, how do you know that? And, and it was every time I asked a question that was something outrageous that she was telling in the story that I thought it must be fantastic, he said, how did you know that? And all the time I said, I read it in her, in her book. Oh, right, her book. Yeah, I've got it somewhere there. And I also have a painting that apparently she had sent uh, a couple of years afterwards. And it was high up in his office. Uh, and he went to show it to me. So it, it was the recognition that every time that he was shocked that, how do you know all those facts, that what Leonora Carrington wrote in, in down below was not fiction whatsoever. It was very, very much everything what happened. And it confirmed as well that she must have had pen and paper because there's no way that three years later and after all she went through, she could uh, still remember so clearly uh, all the events that took place. Anyway. Uh, I'll uh, move on to the third part and the, the final part of my, of my work. And it was uh, in, in the third part, I deal with, the, uh, with uh, the years after she gets to Mexico. I analyze particularly the stone door and the hidden trumpet. 
And in the stone door, I also uh, uh, mentioned that there are, again, like with everything about her, ambiguous, well, uh, not ambiguities, but there are two texts, different versions. And one of the things that uh, I question a lot, made me think, why would that be so, is that um, there is a version of uh, the stone door. The one that is popular is the one with the boy Zacharias, that I analyze as a kind of labyrinth with a door in the middle, and the chapters revolve around, it, it, it is all uh, structurally, uh, it is labyrinthical. And chapter four stands in the middle where the door is and everything revolves around that door, which is very a paradox to place a door at the heart of a labyrinth. It's so, so Leonora Carrington. So um, that is the story that most people know, the story of her and Chiki meeting and the travels of uh, Zacharias, the Jewish boy, number 105, I think it was, and, and, and Leonora. Uh, meeting, but there was another text that presented a blended uh, character of her and Leonor Medias Varro, where she is called Brigitte Amagoya, Amagoya referring to, to Amaya's niece, uh, to, sorry, to, to Remedia's niece and, and, and Leonora herself. And she amputated that text for, for the later, the, the 1980s or 1990s revisions. And I always wondered why. And I think it's because at the time she was being mim mimetized with Leonora, the word that has happened, with Remedios, a word that has happened already. And I think she, for as much as she really, really enjoyed uh, cooperating, I, I was reading um, uh, Moorhead's biography and she says that she didn't like cooperation. I think she did enjoy a lot of cooperation, but I think she, she feared being misunderstood or not being taken seriously or something happened because she first collaborated with Ernst and then kind of separated her work from, from his and then she collaborated a lot with Varro and then again she struggled throughout the, after uh, Remedio's death, even though she loved her dearly, she keeps uh, saying that her work is different, that they do different things and it's because at the time, uh, starting with Octavio Paz and following by almost everybody that mentioned them, they, their names went together. You, you could not say Remedios Varro without mentioning Leonora Carrington, and you could not say uh, Leonora Carrington without mentioning Remedios Varro. And I think she wanted very much to disengage herself, and that's why I explained to myself she had amputated uh, the stone door for, for the final publication. And then in, in The Hearing Trumpet, uh, the, the way I see it is, is like the culmination of, of her work. It's uh, a beautiful dystopia. Um, it's feminist, it's funny, it's witty. It uses all the elements that have been appearing in her work, but taken to a, a, a magnetic point, I don't know. It, and it's, uh, it's all about uh, repetition and recreation and, and starting life afresh. So, that was finished, that work was finished in, in 1998, and I think it was the first monograph, it must have been the first monograph on the work on Leonora Carrington, I don't know. But, um, well, there was some, someone writing a, an MA thesis in France a few years before, someone from Saint Martin d'Ardèche, and, and, and in a way I've been, ever since then, I've been uh, working on Carrington, coming back to her, but I just wanted to give you an overview of how I've approached her work. Um, I've also tried uh, some things that have been uh, been mentioned in, in the conversations before. I've always I've been an academic. I wanted to be very strict. I use my Kristeva and my Foucault and, and all the, the things, but and, and rejecting Orenstein because he was having this kind of magical approach. I met Orenstein and took her to Madrid to some flamenco and some things like that back in the 90s. And I, but I, I wasn't like, uh, like Orenstein, I wasn't going to put on a Mexican dress and, and find her. But then the magic with her kids returning and returning, I happened to be, for reasons completely different from her, living in Mexico City for, for a year in, uh, in 2007 or 2008. And, uh, and then things, uh, just uh, things that are curious happen around her. And, and it is just that for, ma for as much as I try to be really um, academic about her, I still have this feeling that there is some kind of magic 
with, with her or some magical thinking going on. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. Um, we'll move on quickly now to Alba, Alba Bedez. She's um, doing a PhD at the University of Madrid. Um, let's go forward. to start saying thank you for organizing this symposium. I'm doing my PhD on Carrington's and Barros cultural dissemination with uh, Julia. Um, today Carrington's influence is alive as we have seen today with Katrina's uh, wonderful speech in fashion, paintings, music and dance. I'm particularly interested in the writings. Today I'll focus my attention on two writings that were published when Carrington was still alive, Leonora by Elena Poniatowska and Leyendas de la Novia del Viento by Lourdes Andrade. They were written in Spanish. Yeah. Leonora was written in 2011 by the journalist and writer Elena Poniatowska. The book won the prize Biblioteca Breve in Spain and it was published by Seis Barral. It is divided into 56 chapters and it is about Leonora Carrington's life. Poniatowska and Carrington were good friends. They met in the 50s. Poniatowska interviewed Leonora several times. At the same time, Carrington illustrated Poniatowska's first book, Lilus Kikus, and in 2008, Rondas de la Niña Mala. Although Poniatowska is 15 years younger than Carrington, their lives chose similar paths. Poniatowska was born in Europe, and after the Second World War, her family decided to emigrate to Mexico. Poniatowska witnessed the most important events of the second half of the 20th century in Mexico, and she worked as a journalist. Poniatowska states Leonora is a novel. However, the information about Carrington's life is very accurate. The book's cover is a picture of Leonora Carrington, Paul Eluard and Max Ernst taken by Lee Miller. This picture suggests we're in front of a historical document. Also, if we have a look at the long bibliography at the end of the book, we can realize this book is based in an extensive research. Every place in the text is described with accuracy. Her childhood in Crockett Hall, her short residence in Italy, the surrealist atmosphere in Paris, Franco's Madrid, and her exile to New York and finally to Mexico. Poniatowska uses a journalist style to describe these places and to relate them to the historical context. So Leonora is also a portrait of the second half of the 20th century. The Second World War, the massive exile to America and the social movements of the 60s are described. Poniatowska uses short sentences, many verbs, no adjectives at all, and a clear style. This also makes Leonora a, a journalist report. However, at the same time, an intimate and poetic tone is used. An example of this intimate tone is the title of the book. Leonora is the first name of the artist. She was probably called Leonora by those who were close to her. For Poniatowska, Leonora is an extraordinary human being. Nevertheless, she doesn't mythicize Leonora. She de describes Leonora Carrington in her everyday life and she uses an everyday language. 
The text is full of colloquialisms and Mexican expressions. But Poniatowska uses words like bailotea or zocalitos. Leonora is written in the present. This then makes the reader grow with the character, and therefore it makes the reader be closer to Carrington. The poetic tone is used to describe Leonora's imagination, her thoughts and feelings. For instance, in the first pages, porridge is compared to the Windmer Lake. The poetic style introduces the reader in Carrington's privacy. Leonora is neither a novel or a biography. Leonora is a mix of both, what it has been called a biographical novel. Leonora Carrington is in this book a symbol of all the dreams, violence and suffering of the last century. But Leonora Carrington is, someone, is also someone close to the reader and part of a fantastic world. And this is Leyendas de la Novia del Viento. It was published in 2011, uh, sorry, 2001 by Artes de Mexico. And it was written by the Mexican academic Lourdes Andrade. The book is also about Leonora Carrington. It is divided in four parts. A prologue, two chapters, Juegos Prohibidos and La Luna y Sus Consecuencias, and an epilogue. Andrade became an academic specialized in Mexican surrealism. She had lots of friends who were part of the surrealist movement. Andrade read Carrington's tale when she was very young. The first time Andrade and Carrington met was in an interview for the magazine Letras Libres. Andrade was fascinated by Carrington's humor and fantasy in that interview. She wrote about her in two other books, Desorientación General, Tres Ensayos sobre México y el Surrealismo, and Leonora Carrington, Historia en Dos Tiempos. In both essays, she underlines the importance of fantasy not only in Carrington's paintings and writings, but also in her life. Leyendas de la Novia del Viento was the last book she wrote. According to Andrade, Leyendas de la Novia del Viento is una insólita mezcla, an unusual mix. It is neither, neither an essay or fiction. The greatest achievement of this book is this mix. Quotes, interviews, and historical references go together with unconventional comparisons and personal thoughts. This mix makes the text confusing. At first sight, at first sight anyone could say this is an essay, but soon after we realize, we realize it is not. This writing wants to be faithful to Carrington's fantasy. In order to achieve this purpose, Andrade uses the surrealist writing techniques. The narration is not lineal. It doesn't have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And it reminds me to the surreal automatism. In Leyendas de la Novia del Viento, Andrade is interested in some surrealist topics, such as the impossibility of love, cannibalism, and dreams. Andrade uses, Andrade uses humor as well, and she makes unusual and free comparisons. Leonora Carrington is not only a real person in this book, she's also a character. Evaline, Fantil, and Francis are in many aspects in this book, Leonora Carrington. Evaline, a character in The Seventh Horse, is described by Andrade like this, it says, Evalín, como Leonora, es siempre indiferente a las reglas del comportamiento humano. Posee un carácter naturalmente colérico. About Francis, the main character of Little Francis, Andrade says, El protagonista, Francis, quien a pesar de ser un personaje masculino, muestra en su carácter rasgos de la propia Leonora. About Fantil, the main character in Monsieur Cyril de Guindre, Andrade says, Fantil responde a una descripción que bien podría aplicarse a la autora. Andrade doesn't only relate these characters to Leonora, but she also doesn't make any difference between Carrington and her characters. In the prologue, she intentionally confuses Leonora and Lucrecia, a character of the Oval Lady. ¿Se llamaba Lucrecia? No, Leonora. This happens again in the first chapter of the book, where she names Leonora and Lucrecia at the same time.
I brought these two books because I found some similarities. Both books were written in Spanish by two Mexican women, and both writers were close friends to Leonora Carrington. <coughs> Andrade and Poniatowska understand their own writings as the result of a shared intelligence and sensitivity with Carrington. As Poniatowska says, Leonora is based on her conversations with Carrington. Es una obra basada en conversaciones que sostuvimos durante múltiples entrevistas, en los libros de la propia autora y los que se han escrito sobre ella, de Whitney Chadwick, Susan Albert and Julia Roche. Andrade highlights in the introductory note to the book their mutual understanding as well. Ya no estaba sola con mis fantasías. Lucrecia, la dama oval, vivía un delirio análogo a aquel que me provocaban las visitas al convento. Empecé a pensar en Leonora Carrington como mi cómplice. A partir de entonces nos hemos acompañado en otras extraordinarias aventuras. Some critics have also underlined the importance of this collaboration. Oropesa compares Poniatowska's Leonora with a matryoshka doll. A matryoshka doll is a set of wooden dolls of decreasing size, size uh, placed one inside another. For Oropesa, Leonora has the same structure. In this book, Poniatowska creates Leonora, and Leonora creates her own characters like Drusil or Lucrecia. In Leyendas de la Novia del Viento, the triangle Leonora, Andrade, Lucrecia appears all the time. Andrade creates Leonora, and Leonora creates Lucrecia. According to Martina Suarez, this coming together is the most interesting characteristic of the book. He says, La genialidad está en la confluencia de dos sensibilidades que saben conversar con los seres del aire. For Poniatowska Andrade, <coughs> eh, and Andrade, art is the result of a collaboration. Andrade, she also collaborated with many artists in her lifetime, as Julia said. In my opinion, Carrington pushes Andrade and Poniatowska to collaborate with her. On the other hand, Andrade and Poniatowska both write fiction this time. Andrade was an academic. Although the Leyendas de la Novia del Viento looks like an essay, it is not. It's fiction. On the other hand, Poniatowska is a journalist. Although Leonora has lots of journalist characteristic, characteristics, it's also fiction. Leonora is, as we said before, a biographical novel. Leyendas de la Novia del Viento is an unusual mix between an essay and an artistic piece. This is, in my opinion, Carrington's influence. She pushes her friends to exceed the limits of their disciplines and create fiction. In 1998, Andra, uh, oh sorry, at this point to conclude, uh, we could ask ourselves, is Leonora Carrington a character or a real person in Leonora and Leyendas de la Novia del Viento? In 1998, Andrade distinguished in Leonora Historia en dos tiempos the existence of two times in Carrington's biography. La biografía de Carrington se sucede en dos tiempos, el tiempo real, histórico, objetivo, constituido con vaso en hechos concretos que han sido relatados una y otra vez, y el tiempo mítico, onírico, subjetivo, el de los sueños y ensueños, aquel en, en el que ha podido imaginar y dar forma a sus obsesiones, a sus fantasías, a sus miedos y deseos. Leonora's biography has two times, the real time, or historical time, where real facts, events, and experiences take place, and the mythical time, where Carrington's imagination, fantasies, obsessions, fears, and desires take place. It is difficult to state whether Carrington is a real person or a character in these two writings. Poniatowska and Andrade play with these two times, the real and the mythical, to give a more faithful description of what Leonera is. Most experiences and information that both writers give about Leonora are true. However, at the same time, Andrade and Poniatowska use their imagination to create their own artistic writings, and therefore, Leonora becomes a character. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alba. Uh, lovely to hear some Spanish there, which would have been Leonora's second language. Uh, I'd like to now welcome Dr. Alicia Kent. 
she lectures in comparative literature and Spanish, Portuguese, and Latin American studies at King's College, London. And she has research interests in the literature and visual arts of the early 20th century. Um, her current research includes projects investigating domesticity in surrealism and the avant-garde domesticity and visuality in Leonardo Carrington, um, amongst other female artists. Hi, thank you very much. Can I say a big thank you to Michelle uh, and the or other organisers of today for including me on the programme. Um, I've really enjoyed the papers from this morning. I think it's been very interesting how um, the different papers have spoken to one another as we've gone through the day. And I hope that in my talk, which is going to be about ageing in Leonora Carrington's work, it will also play its part um, in the bigger conversation that we're having about Carrington's work today. Until I turned 75, I found old age rather agreeable. I enjoyed playing at early senility. I loved reading Simone de Beauvoir's Les Vieilles. During the last five years, however, true old age has begun. Whole series of petty annoyances attack me. I've begun to complain about my legs, my eyes, my head, my lapses of memory, my weak coordination. The enemy is everywhere and I'm painfully conscious of my decrepitude. These are the words of Luis Buñuel, Spanish surrealist and filmmaker, discussing his experience of ageing in his memoir, My Last Sigh. The vision of ageing that Leonora Carrington offers us in The Hearing Trumpet is different and more optimistic, however. Through her protagonist, 92-year-old Marianne Leatherby, Carrington offers us a view of old age as a time and space in which women in particular can continue to be creative and a time when that creativity can be valued. Marianne Leatherby is a grandmother and the heroine and narrator of Carrington's The Hearing Trumpet. She is deaf, has no teeth but a short grey beard and lives with her son, daughter-in-law and youngest grandson in their house in Mexico City. She spends her days in the backyard of the house with her two cats a hen, a maid and her two children, some flies and a cactus plant. She dreams of the Northern Hemisphere, of her English homeland and of Lapland, her destination of dreams. Carrington captures the predicament of Marion's old age perfectly when she writes, I give no trouble at all and keep myself clean with no assistance from anybody. Marion is the archetypal dependent elder whose domestic situation takes a familiar turn when, thanks to the hearing trumpet gifted to her by her friend Carmela, Marion overhears her family's plan to ship her off to a home for senile females. Aware that she's become a burden and without the reserves to fight it, Marion prepares her things and is taken to the home by her family, accompanied by Carmela. Rather than this being the end of the story, Marion's life in the home, run by the Well of Light Brotherhood, marks the start of a series of unlikely events involving winking nuns, werewolves, and a new ice age. The implied fear, fear of the elderly of dying in the home does indeed occur in the novel, but the rebirth which follows heralds the start of a new life, as Marion steps back from old age into something more like eternal life. By the end of the novel, the world has literally turned on its axis, and the narrative finishes with the realisation that Marion and her elderly companions are now living somewhere near Lapland. As Marion observes, if the old woman can't go to Lapland, then Lapland must come to the old woman. <laughs> the Hearing Trumpet then is a tale of old age, and women's old age specifically. Its limitations and familiar tropes but also its creative possibilities and freedoms. Described as a novel or a novella, its format is difficult to pin down. It has no chapters or sections, contains letters, poetry, 
incantations, typographical variations, and almost 30 of the 158 pages are given over to another text, a nun's tractate, Mise en Abîme. Jean Anderson observes that if we are to explore the full range of women's experiences through literature, we must look to short stories because it's unusual to find old people as central characters in longer works of fiction. A recurrent issue for women artists and writers is the uncritical desire to see their imaginative work as somehow directly connected to their bi biographies. Carrington is no exception to this. The premise of The Hearing Trumpet capitalises on the freedom which follows the beauty of youth and the all-consuming demands of motherhood a freedom in old age brought about by no longer being looked at or needed. Women and women's work occupy a central position in Carrington's iconography. Motherhood and the domestic setting are all chosen by Carrington as important spaces worthy of depiction and dissection. As she says in The Hearing Trumpet, houses are really bodies. And obviously we've seen this quote already in Katrina and Felicity's paper. Here I just want you to notice that at the end of the quote, in the hearing trumpet, the emphasis is on the aged body that's of interest here. Carrington's female bodies are also often made up of non-human parts. In Darvaux, and, and then we saw the daughter of the Minotaur, both of which depict familial scenes with figures of children who resemble her sons. The human figures, especially the mother figures, are fantastical, otherworldly, if not indeed alien. In the house opposite, where the location of the viewer is clearly specified, the women inhabitants have animal shadows or tree-like heads, recalling and arguably reclaiming terms like witch, sorceress or even crone. In these pictures, it's difficult to attribute an age to the female subjects but they have much in common with the fantastical creatures of the hearing trumpet. Ali Smith writes in her introduction to the Penguin edition of the hearing trumpet that this is a quietly visionary novel. I'm not sure whether quiet refers to the renown of the novel, the tenor of Carrington's work, or the unlikely heroine of the tale, but within this unclassifiable text, Carrington makes new worlds possible. Carrington makes explicit reference to surrealism in The Hearing Trumpet. Shortly before the nun's text is introduced, in a section in which Marion remembers her life and family in England, Carrington writes, Art in London didn't seem quite modern enough, and I want, began to want to study in Paris, where the surrealists were in full cry. Surrealism is no longer considered modern today, and almost every village, rectory and girls' school have surrealist pictures hanging on their walls. Even Buckingham Palace has a large reproduction of Magritte's famous slice of ham with an eye peering out. It hangs, I believe, in the throne room. Times do change indeed. This paragraph reflects the changes seen by Carrington in her lifetime, up until the point of writing The Hearing Trumpet. And, at the point of its publication, the novel also functions as a meditation on the living legacy of surrealism. And, perhaps, an artist's meditation on her own excuse me, on her own relevance after an already long career. André Breton, the self-proclaimed leader of the French Surrealists, was dead by 1966, and questions had been raised before then about Surrealism's relevance. In My Last Sigh, Buñuel refers to the late 70s, and in particular 1977, when the hearing trumpet was published in English and French as an annual fatal to the Surrealist group, when Man Ray, Alexander Calder, Max Ernst and Jacques Prévert all died. Carrington would live on for another 34 years. Commenting on surrealism's adoption into the mainstream and indeed royalty, Carrington reflects on the significance of longevity in art, and especially in surrealism, an avant-garde art and literary movement so focused on the concerns of youth, the new, the shocking and the iconoclastic. The reference to René Magritte's The Portrait underlines Carrington's artistic link to the Belgian painter who shared Edward James as a patron. The painting, as you can see, depicts a table set for dinner with a bottle of wine, water glass, knife and fork and a plate of ham. 
It's difficult to think of surrealism's visuality without thinking of the work of Magritte. Yet he would never have been described as a domestic painter, despite the fact that he too painted in his kitchen, and chose as his subject things domestic as well as otherworldly. For Magritte, the domestic is banal, even drab. That's one description of his work. Carrington, however, explored the magic within dom women's domestic life. Even as Carrington seeks to reclaim the domestic space, the gender difference of space remains. It is positive for women because it's a negative space for men. More recently, Carrington's kitchen has been compared with Breton's study, revealing it too to be a place of work and creativity and equalising the difference. Cooking is a key theme in The Hearing Trumpet, as the elderly women of the Institute are reborn towards the end of the novel in the cauldron of hot broth. Crucially, the women do not benefit from an elixir of youth. They remain old. Marion recognises her face in an obsidian mirror and claims that she felt very well and refreshed after the hot broth and somehow deeply relieved, just as I felt long ago after I had the last of my teeth out. The infirmity of old age, to which Beaumont refers at the end of my last sigh, is cooked away. And Marion changes from being a drooling sack of decomposing flesh at the start of the narrative, to being now as spry as a mountain goat, following her alchemical rebirth. Carrington continued to paint into her eighties, and her interest in the elderly and elderly women continued as she too aged. In the painting Chrome Flower, for example, Carrington deliberately engages the figure of the older woman. As in The Hearing Trumpet, Mexico City appears to be the setting, given the architecture, the women's dress, and also the cracks in the pavement, a reference to the earthquake which took place in Mexico City in 1985, two years before the painting was made. To the centre left of the painting, under a bare tree, stand three wizened old women, possibly widows, studying a red flower which has grown up through the cracks in the pavement. A visual play on the image of beauty represented by the flower, surrounded by old age and wrinkles. The viewer is drawn in to contemplating its significance alongside the ageing observers. To the right of the group of three women walks a fourth woman, smoking, wearing a red hat and a coat, which looks like it features the pelt of a cat and may indeed be made from cat hair. In the hearing trumpet, Marion hopes to wear a cat hair jumper one day, and is saving the fur for Carmela, her friend, to knit. A large shadow of a cat appears in the front right of the picture, as if the view of the painting is a cat. Ghostly faces and bodies, which also appear to be female, hide behind curtains or run upstairs in the background. To the very right of the picture sits a figure draped in a cloth. The painting is dreamlike and surrealist in its combination of the unexpected and the quotidian. At first glance, Carrington has painted the dailiness of a street scene. But as with the other everyday settings in her art and literary work, nothing is what it first seems. There is also great humour in Carrington's art and literary work, humour which centres on the elderly. In, in The Hearing Trumpet, Carmela cautions, one can never trust people under 70 and over seven. And Marion states that she has no need of teeth as, I don't have to bite anybody. As Joanna Moorhead observes in her excellent new biography, Carrington had a very dry sense of humour. For me, there are links between Carrington and Spike Milligan, also of Irish heritage, a member of the Goons, initially a UK radio show which ran in the 50s, and whose off-kilter humour had much to surrealism, and which begat later television comedies like Monty Python's Flying Circus. Humour in the hearing trumpet works against the loss of visibility which comes with old age, or the cloak of invisibility, as Penny said in her first poem. As Marion states, if I ever appear there, at the front of the house, now it is always rather in the nature of a spectre. Carrington exploits this invisibility of old age through the introduction of the hearing trumpet, which allows Marion to listen into her family's conversations about her without being seen. Her invisibility is matched by a freedom through deafness to listen to her interior voice and be apart from the noise of family life. As readers, we are invited to listen to this voice and this narrative, as well as to read it. At the end of the tale, which is written in the style and the tradition of an oral account, we are told that this document will be passed on. 
Towards the beginning of the hearing trumpet, Marion observes that sleeping and waking are not quite as distinctive as they used to be. I often mix them up. While this may be a description of old age, and perhaps a related illness like dementia, it is also the surrealist ideal. Surrealist art and literature pursues the creation or recreation of this moment between wakefulness and sleep, when the mind is able to wander unbound by grammar or social conditioning. It seems to me that this is the state that Carrington paints and writes, and in the hearing trumpet and crown flower, Carrington appears to be suggesting that it is in old age that this state is at its most attainable. Thank you. So we would like to offer five minutes if there are any pressing questions or interesting questions. And then obviously during lunchtime, um, there will be a nice opportunity to continue mixing and conversing and seeing where else Leonora has a to use some of his expression. Uh, and I think I'd just like to invite as well, just within this, oh, sorry. Just within this context of, uh, hello, <laughs> uh, because we are in an educational um, institution, um, perhaps how we might take Carrington forward, where you know we're with her legacy, um, and as educators, is there responsibility in that, or do we just allow Carrington to tap us on the shoulder? So that's a nice small provocation. Do we have any questions? The microphone. Um, can I change it? Probably. Oh, it's, it stops oh okay. Um, thank you to the three of you for the wonderful talks. Um, my question um, goes to Alba because um, I think it's very interesting to draw on these examples of um, uh, Poniatowska and uh, Lourdes Andrade um, concerning style. Because, I mean, the, the novel of. No, it doesn't. The novel of. Pon I wonder, like, if you want to write about Carrington, right? As you said, both of them are fiction. The, the, the novel of Poniatowska seemed to me a bit... Oh, sorry. Well, maybe I talk like that. The Poniatowska's novel seemed to me almost a bit, like, um, a, a bit boring in its documentary style, given the fact, like, the, the vivid imagination of Carrington, and then you have this documentary style and the, with a lot of dialogues of Poniatowska. Lourdes de Andrade tries to do the opposite. So it's very interesting to see um, how, how, how you would deal, you know, with the, to, to write about Leonora Carrington in, in considering style, because I mean, this might be something that, that could be interesting also in your access to, to these two authors. My, my question would just be, if, if yeah, what, what do you think, actually, of the style that Poniatowska used, whether this is more accurate to write about Carrington than that of Louis and Nadel. But, um, yeah, I want to go further, because... So what do I think about her yeah. style? Yeah. Um, well, I'm very, mm. I'm very interested in mm. his uh, writings because of this style. So uh, I did like a lot. Uh, Poniatowski's novel, and I didn't find it boring, but I understand what you say when you say that she's given a lot of information. But sometimes, if it's a novel, why well, should she? Um, yeah, and, uh, and also what I'm interested in is about uh, Carrington yeah, as a character or a real person in their fictional works, yeah, so, yeah, and style there is. Yeah. So. Maybe just but because this also goes hand in hand with her auto-fictions, right? This is yeah. like linked together. Yeah, 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 that's not the, uh, the, yeah, um, 
emphasis as well on what the current sounds like to speak is to take real people and put them as characters in the internal of this, right? Because I may be also to fully aside of what kind of title and title from in the hearing samples of the stone door. There's so much written in the press at the moment about old age and Alzheimer's, etc. Now, I'm a person in my mid-70s, and I find, in answer to your question, um, Leonora's vision to be exciting and stimulating and therapeutic. So, yes, I think her work must be um, expanded and expanded to people of my category particularly. Thank you. Leonora Carrington anticipates the almost double invisibility of women as they get older sure. and tries to, um, within the hearing trumpet, uh, create a space that isn't about her biography but is about old age and the creative possibilities of making that space within old age mm. when perhaps the demands of family life um, or in, in her particular case, the way in which her, her own beauty led to her being seen as the, the, the very image of the femme enfant, the French surrealist movement, moving away from those concerns which are pressed on to Carrington and, and using the invisibility of old age as a cover to do all kinds of fantastic things mm. while nobody's looking. Don't look over here, don't see what I'm doing here. Um, and I think that's, that in itself is innovative enough hoping that this will be part of a broader conversation. About. Why shouldn't we? We're living 10 to 15 years longer no. now. Exactly. And I certainly don't feel invisible. Absolutely. My children don't think I'm invisible. <laughs> Absolutely. And the hearing trumpet was in that sense ahead of its time because she talks about issues now that we might think of as veganism or even clean eating, uh, eco-tourism, uh, Apocalypse. I mean, there are a number of themes in that text which are sort of um, in advance of their time, and, and the focus on old age is absolutely wonderful. And also, it could come from her vision. You know, when she leaves the hospital and she says, um, it was very much like having been dead, mm. and she felt things like an old crone. Yeah. That, when she says she had lost all her teeth, and probably she very, very young. Yeah. She inhabits or she can share the feelings yeah. of someone. I wanted to ask you, had she really lost all her teeth? Yes. Yes. Yeah, because she mentions it in the letters to Paris. Yes, but that was later on. I mean, it was not during the Santander. Oh, right. OK. But it made her feel like the experience, definitely, I think, pushed her to a place where she it looked young, but it felt, yeah. And just having that experience of having what you mean as an artist enforced upon you by the way that you look, mm. yeah. and having to think through that moment, I think, is is where the the, the emphasis on old age. I think that's where that's going to. Okay, we're going to round up there for now. But if you could take your questions onto the sandwiches and the carrots. And um, our chef at Edge Hill has prepared for today, especially for today, bubble for sweet. <laughs> <laughs> but with all the organisation, I haven't actually had time to do what we should do, that beef eater moment of actually tasting it. So we're all going to first time yeah, taste it on the bubble and sweet. I've found the Spanish translation of bubble and sweet. It's burbujas y chilido. <laughs> and, and the reason we've got bubble and squeak on is because Gabriella told us that Leonora used to make bubble and squeak uh, for the, the kids and, and other um, friends and family members because obviously that's a Lancastrian delicacy. 